then if you want a religion based on your theology, well, obviously, here you go again, you've got a pope, haven't you? And then you've got the, the curia in Rome, and then you've got a whole hierarchy, we actually use the word hierarchy, for the bishops and archbishops and so forth. So this pattern, you see, is getting deeply entrenched in our, uh, <coughs> in our culture. I repeat, it's, we've inherited it, it, reinforced it by our institutions, and so we come to government. And off we go again, and we've got government doing exactly the same thing, breaking itself up from a king to barons, or from a dictator to the people he appoints. And, and even in democracies, we have, we have a so-called democratically elected leader broken down into, into divisions. And all this is coming with it. That's the interesting thing. Uh, the last one is just management, of which government is a special example, of course. And what I'm arguing is that the whole of this is turning up in here, whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. And thus, our methods of government and our methods of management are wholly reductionist in their character. Is there any alternative to this? Have you ever seen this symbol of a snake? The Greeks used this symbol. It's called Ouroboros, and it's a snake eating its own tail. Now, this is a different way of looking at the world from reductionism. It is a way of closure. It is a way of putting everything together. And we find it in physics emerging in relativity, which is non-reductionist. And we find it emerging in biology in terms... Let me explain. If I asked you what makes a living thing, I think you are likely to answer that it can reproduce itself. Well, in modern biology, the idea is that it's much more important to, to note the fact that a living organism produces itself. You will have to change every cell in your body within the next seven years, but you will still have to be recognizably yourself. And this is the thing called auto, meaning self, paesis, which is to make yourself. And autopaesis is a new kind of phenomenon in the way biologists are thinking. So both these are, these are the emerging ideas that are contradictory to that. Now, not everybody is, has caught up with this. Why, had, why has it taken? It took well over 50 years before anybody took relativity seriously. It was because you cannot express it in these terms. And we're having much the same trouble with this now, as I'll try and show you later on. As to reasoning, well, I use the term closure. We have the notion of mathematical closure here. This is the new line. Let me put that across primarily through logic. Do you all know Gödel's theorem? Anybody know Gödel's theorem? Gödel's theorem in logic says that it is impossible to construct a theoretical language which is to say a mathematics or a logic that will not close on itself with the result that there are statements that are undecidable in that language. In other words, the language is the language and there are things you cannot say inside it. Now this isn't because the police are waiting outside, it's because the logical construction of the language will not permit it. The other thing, so these are, these are mathematical concepts, the philosophical concepts come from Hegel, and I would like you to take special note of his axiom of internal relations, if you don't know it. <coughs> this sounds complicated, so you take it in pieces. The relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. Do you think you've got that? 
the relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. So relativity and Hegel, you see. What that says is that if you had a, a, an elephant as small as a mouse, it wouldn't be an elephant because the fact that an elephant is intrinsically percept, perceived as bigger than a mouse is part of the elephantness of the elephant and part of the mouseness of the mouse. Now that at once produces thoughts about system, which is what I'm talking about today, really, because it all comes down to that in the end that if you are more concerned about the relatedness of things than about the hierarchical reductionist approach to things, then you take off from that point and you think about this, the network of relationships rather than the things themselves. Now look at the consequences for that in theology. You start by saying, well, we don't have to go to God through all this uh, paraphernalia of, of the church, we can, we can have a gospel base and speak directly to God. And that's where the thing begins with, with people like Quakers and uh, you know, gospel people in the United States and so forth. So that becomes an alternative. But nowadays, again, looking at the relatedness of things, people are thinking much more in terms of, of groups of people, are they not, um, who embrace each other, new age thinking, all of those kind of things are replacing uh, the ancient theology. And, you know, when I said that the, the systems we use are collapsing, uh, we tend to resist that when we're talking about politics, economics, management. We tend to think, well, we'll make it work. But just look at the example of theology. Look at the loss of influence and the collapse of that system, as a historical fact, I mean, over the last several hundred years. Uh, the number of people who are operating that system now are very tiny compared with what they were in medieval times, quite obviously. So these are alternative ways of, of looking at things. The theological alternatives here are very ancient. The Northern Indian Vedantic philosophy is highly non-reductionist. It is of the systemic kind. And that Vedantic philosophy went, went into Hinduism, which went into Buddhism, which went into Zen. And please note that by the time you get to Zen, you are explicitly denying Aristotle's law of non-contradiction. Because in Zen, the whole perception is that the thing and not the thing are present together. <laughs>